Thanks, Neil. So we're going to shift gear from the science a little bit and talk about negotiating um, hospital contracts. And they come in a number of different varieties. There are professional service uh, arrangements, there's clinical co-management agreements, there's call coverage, and there are quality improvement uh, programs. And when you start to negotiate and you approach your hospital CEO, the things that you have to take into consideration are the level of autonomy that you want, the level of clinical integration uh, between you and your hospital, the time to implement what sort of infrastructure and cost it's going to be, the scale, if it's just one hospital, it's the entire system, and of course, payer interest. And, you know, we're LUGPA. We're much more on this side of the scale. But even if you're an employed urologist, uh, uh, be it uh, directly for hospital or academics, um, you need to work with your hospital um, and you need to get paid for your expertise in what you do because you can save the hospital a lot of money um, uh, by providing the appropriate services. Why do hospitals even want to partner with us? Well, a lot of them are buying doctors right now, but they have no idea how to effectively manage a service line, particularly if it's a new service line like urology. They may know how to manage hospitalists, emergency room doctors, cardiac surgery, things that are typically hospital-based. But urology is not typically hospital-based, and most hospitals don't know how to, how to manage it. They're going to get reimbursed on value-based care, um, so it's important that we create the value for them. There is plenty of money on the table, so it's worthwhile for them. Obviously, they need us to take call for them, um, and their patients require our specialization as subspecialization and it improves their ability to compete for admissions if they've got an efficient urology service. Why do we want to partner with them? Well, it is better care. Um, you know, if you can get a hospital to provide 24-7, 365 PA coverage for you uh, to handle the first hits on the floor, uh, it reduces response time from a doctor, the patients get taken care of uh, much faster, much more expeditiously. Um, we want to reduce their incentive to develop internal urology departments. We want to protect our independence and our referral base. Um, we certainly want to increase position productivity. We need to work at the level of our degree uh, in order to generate revenue for our practice. We want to help improve OR efficiency. Um, we can help them do that. Um, and um, if a hospital is part of a large system, um, and you partner with them, you can be the urology group for the entire system. So it helps expand your geographic reach um, and improves, uh, it, it gets you bigger and improves your volume. For the patients, they get improved access to care. They get consistent application of evidence-based medicine, access to well-trained physicians, improved con consistent quality and safety. Um, so let's start with some of the low-hanging fruit call coverage. Hospital engages a group of specialists who agree to provide detailed call coverage and other quality improvement services. Specialists from more than one practice may form an LLC to be the contracting entity, and physicians in the group become the on-call panel that are responsible for setting the call coverage schedule. It's usually 24-7, 365. It includes ED coverage, uh, hospital consults, unassigned patients, unassigned ED patients. You have to adhere to mandatory response times. Uh, and obviously you have to round in, uh, on those patients and take care of them. We collect and uh, bill for our services and we get a flat fee for coverage. And the valuation of that flat fee is the extent of burden on the physician, the likelihood of having to come in and respond to the call. Are you a small hospital, large hospital? Are you a level one trauma center? Are you a level three trauma center? Are you not a trauma center? Um, and. Uh, the likelihood you're going to have to provide uncompensated care, what's the free care that your hospital gives away, or what's your Medicaid population. Um, uh, restricted call, meaning if they actually want you in-house, that obviously is a higher compensation than unrestricted call where you're from home, and they've got fair market value considerations as well. So here is a sampling from various parts of the country of what call is. Um, you're not worth as much as you think you are. <laughs> That's the bottom line. Um, when, you, when you go into a hospital and you start to negotiate, you have to understand they're going to talk to you about fair market value. And it does have to be at fair market value because there can't appear to be an inducement um, that they're trying to buy your business. Remember the olden days, 20 years ago, you walked to a hospital and said, um, I'm going to pull all my cases out of your hospital if you don't pay me X amount of dollars for uh, chairmanship or a service line management. That doesn't fly anymore. 
everything has to be uh, according to the compliance policy of the hospital, of your group, and at fair market value. Understand this, this is key, and I learned this um, in one case the hard way, fair market value is never a number. Fair market value is always a range, and you want to know what the range is. And there are a lot of different companies that do the fair market value assessments. Um, there are those that are typically paid by hospitals, and there are those that are paid by doctors. So when a hospital comes to you and gives you a fair market value number, you need to know where it came from, the company that did it, and where it falls at the spectrum. Hospitals are going to try and pay you at the 50th percentile or less. They can very easily go to the 75th percentile without going through um, uh, any sort of business ethics committee or getting lawyers involved to see if it's actually true fair market value. So you want to strive for the 75th percentile. If you can get better than that, great, but then there's a lot more compliance issues there. So this is the range, but in general, uh, roughly about $600 a day, meaning a 24-hour period for a non-trauma 250 to 300 bed hospital is kind of the range. The hospital's bigger, has trauma, you can do a little bit better. Um, but these are, these are the numbers just to so kind of understand uh, what you're going into because you can't walk in and say, you know, we want $500 an hour to take call because that's what we generate in our practice uh, per, per hour. It doesn't work. Service line co-management, <laughs> basic structure. They provide a group of physicians to provide medical management services. The agreement can be with a single group of physicians or multiple groups can come together uh, to form your own company. It includes a medical directorship and selected physician leaders work with hospital administration to oversee and implement the co-management relationship. And the hospital pays the administrative management services and achievement of defined quality objectives. There are committee meetings you have to attend. You have input on financial, budgetary, and strategic matters, supply utilization, staffing and management, supply utilization. You know, if you've got a group of 20, 25 doctors, as one group of doctors insists that we have Boston Scientific stents, another group insists that you have Cook stents, another insists that you have Bard stents. You need everybody to agree to use the same stent. A hospital will save money. Part of that savings can come back to you. Service line policies and procedures, recommendations on clinical pathways and measures, uh, program of service line outreach activities, and quality and performance um, metrics. Um, you are compensated again based on fair market value. Usually it's an hourly rate. Depending on the size of the hospital, the size of the service line, the amount of money going through, the hourly rate is usually between $150 and $300 an hour. You're not worth as much as an, to, as an administrator as you are a clinician. Um, there are certain caps that are going to be established, um, uh, again, because they can only pay you so much money a year. And yes, the work must actually be documented or reported regularly. Uh, our group does it monthly. Quality improvement, um, you define what the initiatives are, and then you establish um, gain sharing uh, types of arrangements based on cost reductions and a set pool of money uh, is predetermined for, for this. The longer the relationship is in place, the harder these initiatives are. Let me give you an example. When our group first started doing this, the initiatives are very simple. Sign your medical records on time, your operative notes and discharge summaries, get it done within 24 hours, and the other one was show up to the operating room on time. Don't show up a half an hour late. Um, that was really low-hanging fruit. And for the first two years while those were in place, we got our money. Then we started doing it. So the bar got raised. How fast did we respond to the emergency room? How fast did we respond to um, uh, uh, consults from the hospitalists? Um, so uh, the longer the arrangements are in place, the higher the bar is going to be because you've already achieved certain goals and they're going to want you to achieve more goals. So understand that. Um, CMS has um, decreased payments to hospitals, higher, uh, uh, hospital acquired infections, uh, including retained foreign objects, certain surgical site infections. Um, you all know this, it's a zero sum game. Some people win and um, some people will lose. So one of the things that um, uh, hospitals are really gung ho about right now are CAUDIs, catheter acquired urinary tract infections. They have no idea how to stop this problem and they don't get paid for the CAUDIs. Um, and it's a metric that the government really watches. 
So you can establish a committee, you can establish a protocol on the use of Foley catheters, you go out educating the nurses and the ER doctors and the hospitalists that there are a lot of ways to monitor urine output. You don't necessarily need a Foley catheter in somebody who's mentally competent and able to avoid. One of the simple things is just stop putting the catheters in and you'll decrease your cauti rate. But uh, that's one thing that's on the table and hospitals are talking about a lot. Patient satisfaction surveys, that's a big thing right now, both inpatient and outpatient. Your length of stay and your complication rate. Hospitals uh, use Crimson data. Crimson's based in Texas. They uh, get a lot of data from uh, all the hospitals. You should be meeting with your vice president um, uh, for medical affairs at your hospital on a quarterly basis. You should find out what your Crimson data is, what they have. You should understand how it is derived. Um, and then you should set targets to try and improve your Crimson data, length of stay, complications, et cetera. And that is a way for the hospital to pay you for improving quality measures. And some of it is, again, educational. So what do I mean by that? When you look at length of stay, you have to understand how they derive their length of stay. And if you have one Fournier's gangrene patient that stayed in the hospital for 60 days and got multiple uh, uh, operations, that is gonna completely mess up your length of stay data uh, from the hospital perspective. But they're just looking at the overall number. So again, learning how to carve out that data is important so that you see what your true length of stay is and you get rid of the outliers. Another thing is post-operative complications. Post-op day one, uh, you walk around on a patient who's had a uh, robotic prostatectomy. If the doctor writes in the chart, patient has an ileus, you now have a complication. No one has an ileus in Poughkeepsie, New York, post-op day one. They have decreased bowel sounds. That is not a complication, but they do not have an ileus. So part of it is learning the system, looking at the key words that Crimson is looking for, and understanding how the data is derived, and you can improve your metrics uh, dramatically. Time to see consults on the floor in the emergency room, on-time surgical starts. Um, again, cost of disposables in the operating room, getting people to agree um, to only carry one stent, one basket, et, et cetera. Research program, I know a lot of LUGPA groups here are doing research. Hospitals have cancer centers now. Cancer centers make money. But cancer centers have to have a certain number of patients per year enrolled in clinical trials. Most hospitals do not know how to manage a research program to get the clinical trials. If you are doing research and you can affiliate your program with the hospital, that is something they can pay you for. It's good for them, it's good for you. Um, hospitals are gonna start evaluating surgeons based on the quality of care before, during, and after surgery. There's gonna be economic credentials. They're gonna look at three surgeons who are doing robotic prostatectomies in the hospital, and they're gonna to wanna to know if one surgeon is 25% um, more expensive than somebody else. Um, Crimson is going live with outpatient as well as inpatient data. Um, and again, quality is the core driver. So in order to negotiate the contract, you've gotta know your data, and you've gotta know their data and where they're getting it. Go after the low-hanging fruit first. Understands the understand the finances, what the hospital is looking to save, so you can monetize the metrics and know what percentage of the savings you can get. Do not have all or nothing contracts. You will lose. Um, you know where your baseline is. You know where you're starting from. There should be an amount of money that you get when you hit your target, and then a tar amount of money when you hit the stretch goal, and then if you become a top decile um, for a certain metric, uh, then that's more money. Um, so set it up on a, on a graduating basis. Um, and make sure you're not penalized for things you cannot control. Certain things the hospital has to do and have on-time start rates, uh, for example, in the operating room, and make sure if the anesthesiologist is late, you are not penalized uh, because it wasn't an on-time start. Trust is critical, but I've been at my hospital now for 20 years, and I've seen eight CEOs get it in writing. That contract is so important because uh, it has to not just survive the current CEO, it has to survive probably four or five more CEOs. Uh, your career at a hospital is much longer than a CEO or a VPMA or a chief operating or financial officer. Everything goes in writing. Um, don't discount on it as he's my friend, of course, he would never uh, uh, cheat me in a contract later on. There's gotta be transparency in the goals and the numbers, agreed upon communication channels, um, uh, 
mutual commitment uh, and you, uh, between the two, and if there's any discrepancy, how you're gonna resolve things. And there have to be defined, clear, measurable targets and exit strategies for both sides if things aren't working out. Hospitals that try for quality without physician engagement will fail. Physicians understand their specialty and we should be compensated now for achieving higher quality and lower costs. And understand if we do not work with hospitals, they will define quality for us, AKA if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. 